So next, we are going to move a little back east and up north to New Jersey. And we are going to have the uh, PPPL or the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory be a part of our next session. And they're gonna show some wonderful demos. I'm really excited to see them as well. They're going to start right after this next video. So uh, get ready and we look forward to seeing our next presenters in a few minutes. Grandiose. We must reduce our dependence on foreign sources of oil. Lyndon Johnson said that, and Richard Nixon said that, and Jimmy Carter said that, and Ronald Reagan said that, all the way through President Obama. And the computer models suggest that if we don't find a non-fossil fuel form of energy soon, then climate change is irreversible, and we've got to figure out how to deal with a warmer Earth, right? Fusion is clean, no greenhouse gases, no long-lived radiation that we have to fight about where we're going to bury it. And because the earth is two-thirds covered in water and the hydrogen in the water, there you get to the unlimited supply of electricity. And some people believe, you know, our community, some people don't. You know, because if you hear about this, you go, wait a minute, either this is too good to be true and there's no possibility, or you're left with, this is crazy. This is the most important thing that we could be doing scientifically. We, you know, wipe out disease and hunger and make a source of energy that never, ever runs out, right? And offer it to the world. So fusion is when you combine two small, very small particles together, like hydrogen, right? Then the final combination, which is a helium atom with one neutron coming out, ends up being at a lower energy state. Hence, it releases energy in the reaction. It's energetically more stable. That wants to happen. So why is it hard to get there? Because of the Coulomb potential, right? As you get two positive charges close together, all they would want to do is repel. You need to get them close enough for the nuclei to touch each other and have this nuclear strong force take over. It's an attractive force that's stronger than the electric repulsion. And that will only happen by chance. It'll only happen when you you get particles in a soup that's hot enough so that every once in a while, two protons are heading towards each other with enough energy such that before they get repulsed, the strong force takes over and grabs it and creates a new atom. If the energy is not high enough, then the probability is either zero or very low. And if the energy is too high, it's also very low. And there's a sweet spot, otherwise they won't fuse. Okay. How does the sun do it? Let's start with that question. Well, it's got a whole bunch of particles. You know, they're moving very fast and then the gravity from the sun is going, come here, don't go out. Keep on trying, keep on trying, right? It's in beautiful equilibrium. The sun is the balance between that pressure of the radiation out and the gravitational force going in. But we're in trouble because we can't do that, right? We need to have a better way of confining the plasma. It's just gonna either melt the walls or the walls are gonna cool down my plasma. So the big question becomes, what's the right container? So the way we do it is with a donut. That's what this laboratory is doing, is making a, a bottle. It's a magnetic bottle, right? Now, in a plasma, what you get is a soup, a whole bunch of charged particles, electrons, and positive ions floating around, yeah? When a charged particle is inside a magnetic field, it starts spiraling around it because the force is perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. That's why if we put a magnetic field that eats its own tail, now it's stuck without touching the walls. So that's the crucial part of magnetic confinement. So it's like the jelly in a donut not being able to touch the glaze because the magnetic field is right down in the middle of the jelly and it won't let the particles diffuse out to, to, to the glaze. There's helmets here for... Do I need to wear one? You do, yeah, yes. Please go over here. In Lake of Plasma, there's kind of a complicated uh, time history of how we do it. So NSTX has uh, like all fusion, magnetic fusion machines at least, vacuum chambers and magnets. So that's the top of the vacuum chamber. That's a completely sort of a large cylindrical, cylindrical shaped vacuum chamber. And then in red here, coming out of the top and going down, are magnets. So those are called the troidal field magnets. And in blue, if you look there, you can see poloidal field magnets. So the blue are big circular magnets. How do you make a plasma discharge? So we start with the vessel pumped down, very low pressure in there, no magnetic fields, just sitting there inertly. Then what we do 
is we turn on these red magnets, the toroidal field coils, and they make the field that goes around the torus this way. The blue coils make a field that points up. That blue one right there, it's got current, and we leave them on without changing their current values for the duration of the plasma discharge. So they're on and they stay on. Then we turn on, at the same time, we drive some current in our solenoid, as we charge it one way, it's about 26 kiloamps of current. Then we rapidly decrease the current in the solenoid. And as we very rapidly turn it off, that's what drives current in our plasma. Maybe there's a few random charged particles in the gas. They're accelerated by the electric field. Maybe they hit another particle and they, they hit an atom and they ionize it. Now you have more charged particles, so they can go off and hit things. And it's an avalanche process. And that's how you start by making this electric field and you can drive it into making a full plasma. So we got plasma there. It's not as hot as we'd like. So then we inject the neutral beams. So straight beam of deuterium atoms, three beams, each of which is two million watts, or six aggregate of six million watts. And those beams, energetic particles in the beams scatter and collide and transfer their energy to the bulk plasma. It takes about 300 milliseconds to sort of form that whole process. And then for 600 to say 1.5 seconds, 600 milliseconds to one and a half seconds, it's kind of just sitting there, steady state. It just sits there and we study it. Temperature's about a, a one kilovolt. And that's like 10 to the fourth times, it's like 10 million degrees. So all the machines you saw today, you know, before you talked to us, were just different ways to make a magnetic bottle. And there's other people you can read about that use electric fields. They use lasers or they, whatever it might be. But in the end, because we can't use gravity to cause, free, we got to do it some other way. Because there's two questions, right? There is the, can we build the machines that can do this, right? That's the first question. And we say yes, and we can debate that scientifically, and we can debate the engineering and the technology and all those sort of things, right? But that's not enough to make usable electricity. You also have to have everything else in place so that the energy that you create has to be competitive economically with the fossil fuels or with fission or with solar or with wind. I mean, if we get there, and we will get there, it's a game changer. That part's, you know, not the hype. So why don't we have it, and how long is it going to take? I would say currently the answer is never, unless we are really serious about funding this. If we're wrong and we can't do it, then the planet goes on to whatever it does, right? If we're right, it changes the planet as we know it because it's a completely new paradigm in a source of energy. Right? So the question becomes, are we willing to take the risk to find out if we're right? I mean, don't you want to be a part of something that changes the planet? That's the bottom line. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I can't really tell. Um, I, uh, my name is Arturo Dominguez. I'm the senior, uh, I'm the head of the science education department. Uh, here at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, and I'm accompanied by uh, Shannon Shannon Greco. Shannon, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm <laughs> Shannon Swilly Greco. I am senior program leader in the science education department at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab uh, with Arturo, and um, I've got all my demos in my basement. I have the coolest basement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I see in the in the list. Yes, if you can add Eric, that would be great. And also, I've, I've got a, uh, some slides, if that's fine. Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Eric Gilson. I'm a, a physicist at the lab, um, and I want to see some of these cool demos today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, we're very happy to join Sunrise to Sunset. We are one of um, 17, oh, of the 17 national labs. We're actually one of the smallest ones, PBPL. Um, and our, our main missions is we, one of the ones that we were saying is, is, is fusion, but also using plasmas in all types of, of science from uh, understanding astrophysical plasmas. For, uh, for example, what, what Eric does um, is, Eric, do you wanna talk a little bit about the astrophysical plasmas you, you study? Sure, yeah. I mean, to, to understand how to make fusion work, you have to understand how lots of different plasmas work. And uh, there's lots of plasmas out there in space, right? On the sun or around black holes and neutron stars, you get disks of uh, stuff falling in. Um, those are the kind of things you can see with the telescope and you can model on a computer, but you'd love to be able to do some experiments. 
So just like you said, um, I do some work here at the lab where we have a lab experiment where we try to make some, some plasma and some liquid metals spin around uh, like they would around a black hole or neutron star and to see if we can learn how those kinds of things really work. Yes. So, so as, as Eric just said, so plasmas in, in astrophysical uh, spaces, we also um, want to study the plasmas that, that we need for, for semiconductor processing and uh, surface modification those types of plasmas. But the main one, especially the main one that we're, the main mission that we're uh, interested to talk about today is fusion. Uh, because as you saw in the video, it's an alternative energy source that's uh, being developed that has a lot of potential to really change the world. Um, so as, as you may know, so let's, let's start with something um, about the scale of plasma. So as, as you may know, plasmas are the fourth state of matter. Um, Shannon, do you want to go through the four states of matter? Sure. Well, I only have one volunteer here with me, my mom. Uh, so if we were live and in person, I could have uh, people come up to the front. Um, so uh, can we get people to, well, actually, we, we can't, people can't live chat, can they? We can only take uh, Twitter. Is that right? No. Oh. Yeah, I think it's That's fine. Um, faith. Yeah. Ooh. I like to talk about the states of matter as so the, there's solid, liquid, and gas, right? So that's what those are like the boring states of matter that Arturo likes to call them. Um, and so it's all about how fast those particles move. So mom, you want to come over here? She doesn't. <laughs> no, 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 just come over, walk over. All right, I'm just gonna back this up a little bit. All right, everybody, meet my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> Susan, you can call her Susan if you want. You call her? Everybody can call her mom. All right. So in a solid, <laughs> oh, Emory says hi, mom. Uh, so in a in a solid, how are we arranged? We're tightly packed and we're not moving very fast, right? So we're gonna get really close, and then we just vibrate a little. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me this. I didn't. I didn't want to. Uh, so. If you go to the next state of matter, liquid. So like if ice melts to liquid water, what do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> we're gonna sink, now we're gonna move around. We're gonna separate oh, a little bit. Okay. And we're gonna, kinda, kinda, we're gonna kinda move, uh, all right? And we're gonna kinda swirl around. We can fill our container at the bottom, right? But we're not gonna float all, all over the place unless we get more energy, you heat it up even more. And then you become, what comes next after solid liquid? Gas, very good. Yes. Uh, so, so then it became a gas. So now we're going to move around a lot, right? So super fast. Woo! That's right. Right. Fill your container. Woo! <laughs> you float out of your container. But then there's the next state of matter, which is what? What's the next state of matter? Plasma, right? Yeah, you can't do it very easily. It's very different from gas. It still moves the same way, but faster. But then pieces start getting ripped off. I'll take your seat. <laughs> uh, so the next state of matter is plasma, and it's fundamentally different from uh, from gas. You can tell when you're looking at a solid. You can tell when you're looking at a liquid. Gases are usually invisible, but then plasmas, something changes. Uh, do you want me to do the uh, half coat of light bulb now? Um, yes. What do we do? But before that, why don't we talk a little bit about the size? So you you were doing this uh, dramatization. You and your mom. <laughs> of the uh, particles moving around. So one thing that I like to talk about when we're talking about the scale of this is that we're the particles themselves are very, very small. Everybody knows atoms are small, but maybe the, not everybody has a sense of how small they actually are. So one analogy that I like to use is that if you have the earth, which is very apropos, that's <laughs> the earth day, and you put a grape, a single grape on top of the earth, that scale size is the same as putting a hydrogen atom on top of the grape, right? So <laughs> imagine you have Google Earth, <laughs> you can focus in, imagine you could focus in on the size of a grape. If you had Google grapes, you would need that same level of zoom in to focus in on a hydrogen atom. That's, that's the size that we're talking about. So when, 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 Shannon and, when Shannon and Susan were doing the dance, You've got to think that that's the scale at which you're doing this. Yeah. So yes, please go ahead. Uh, show your. 
Yep. All right. So I'm going to actually, Mom, can you turn off that light switch that's closest to me? All right. And then I'm going to have you come over here. So, um, oh, it's really dark, isn't it? Um, can you turn it back on? Sorry. <laughs> A little darker than I thought it was going to be. All right. Can we highlight my screen again? <clears throat> All right. Thank you. All right. So right here, I've got um, what's basically a normal fluorescent light bulb. Uh, but if you notice, only half of it has that white coating that you usually see on fluorescent light bulbs. I have another like smaller one here. Um, so you can see that half of it is coated. Sorry, my screen is uh, not mirrored and I'm not used to that. I keep moving things the wrong way. So this is uh, this paint that they usually put on fluorescent light bulbs. And it takes the light that's absorbed by the plasma, because there's going to be plasma in there when we put some high voltage through. Uh, it takes the light that's absorbed and re-emits it at something closer to natural light. We'll talk about that too. So in here, I have a plasma. And now I have a gas. And now I have a plasma. <laughs> Uh, so you can see that this kind of blue color is the light that gives us. So that's what happens once a gas is turned into a plasma. It starts giving off light. I love this demo because it shows three cool things about plasma. So one, they give off light. Two, if you can see when I turn this off, there's no wire connecting the two electrodes. There's an electrode on both ends of this bulb, and there's no wire connecting it. And gas doesn't normally conduct electricity super well. But if you got a high enough voltage and a close enough distance at the right density, all those things combined can turn that gas into a plasma. And when that happens, the electrons of each atom get knocked off and they can go places. And electrons going places, that's electricity. So they become conductive. So we've got electricity going through. Now the electricity is going from electrode to electrode through the plasma. So plasma is low and they conduct electricity. And then the third thing, I need some sunglasses to dim this a little bit so that you can see. Let's try these, because these are less scratched. Yeah, that's good. Can you hold that right like that, Mom? All right, so I dimmed it a little bit so you can see it a little more clearly. At the bottom of this, I have um, some magnets, one down here and one up here a little bit. We're gonna see the third cool thing that's very important for our research um, when we do this. We're gonna slide it up. Ooh, that's pretty good. These are my favorite sunglasses for this now. Can you see what it's doing to the plasma? Mom, what do you think's doing? What's happening? <laughs> so it's actually squishing the plasma and kind of changing its shape and it's condensing it in, this, in certain spots. So what plasmas do when you've got those charged particles, those electrons get knocked off and, uh, and it, they are now charged particles and they get stuck on magnetic field lines. Uh, so they, you can actually control plasmas, and that's super important for our work. Thanks. Because, um, as Arturo will talk about in a second, uh, the plasmas that we use are super, super hot. And as you saw in the video, it's super hot. We can't rely on the um, Earth's mass. Um, the Earth's mass. Uh, I mean, because it's a lot smaller than the sun. The sun has a ton of mass, and it keeps all those particles tight uh, by gravity but we have to get them super hot so that they'll smash, so they'll overcome those repulsion, the static electricity, we can talk about that too. Um, we get them going super fast and we get them squished together, but they're so hot when they're that fast. Hot and fast, right? We get those particles from solid to liquid to gas to plasma. They get going super hot, super fast, and they're gonna burn up your box that you put them in, that magnetic bottle. So the reason it's a magnetic bottle is you can use that property of the magnet um, moving the, the plasma, those charged particles, you can use the magnets, wrap your whole machine up in magnets and squish it away from the walls. And so you're containing that hot, hot plasma with magnets. I'll turn it back Thanks, to you. Thanks, Adam. This is, this is great. Uploading the PP. Hopefully it should be ready. Okay. So, um, so why don't we talk a little bit, thanks, uh, Shannon, you showed some great uh, plasmas, but why don't we talk about some other examples of plasmas? Um, we have this uh, chat here, or maybe if, if uh, there isn't too much of a lag, people on Twitter might uh, be able to answer some of these questions, but um, what are some examples of plasmas that you know about from just your daily life, uh, going outside, or maybe some that Shannon has already shown are there any any ideas out there of some plasmas? And we'll 
read some from the from the chat and maybe Faith can can report any that are coming in from Twitter. Oh, oh okay. So we started with a good one with blood. So this this will give us some time. So great. Blood is actually not the type of plasma that we're talking about. Blood, um, but it there is a connection there. Um, so we're talking about the fourth state of matter. So blood is the, the plasma in the blood is is not the type of plasma that we're talking about. But it turns out that the, the reason that the fourth state of matter is called plasma is because uh, one of the founding scientists of our field, uh, Lamier, actually here in, in New Jersey, up in Stevens Institute, um, when, when he was looking at these discharge tubes, similar to the ones that Shannon was showing you, and, she, and, and he saw the colors and the bright colors that, that, that uh, you see from Shannon's demos, um, he said, this actually is very similar to the blood plasma. So that's what the name, that's where the name comes from. But that's what is the plasma. Huh? But, but blood plasma doesn't glow, doesn't conduct electricity, and you can't move it with magnets. But you actually can move blood with magnets, but that's because there's so much iron in your blood. That's why an MRI machine works. Yes, that's correct. So we, so blood, we actually had some shirts that said plasma, not the blood type. So, yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's quite, it's very common. But yeah. stars, yes, stars is a type of plasma. Um, and, and of course the sun, which we want to reproduce any other plasmas, maybe something reminiscent to, to some of the stuff that's behind, uh, Shannon, anything, I don't know if anything is coming in from Twitter or from the, from the chat. Um, we could start, uh, giving some, for example, uh, yeah, like the one that, that, that Shannon is touching kind of looks like one that we see out, uh, when it's raining, uh, lightning, lightning is a type of plasma. So Shannon, do you want to um, maybe create some lightning at home? I would love to. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's electrocute my mom. <laughs> she said she'd rather not. Uh, well, we can do it two ways. You want to do it this way or you want to do it the, uh, the coil? I mean, the it both. Let's do both. Um, and we can put the, the pin on, on that on her, on Shannon's cam. Yes, thanks. If I plug everything in at once, I, I fry my uh, circuit breaker. All right, so let's see. Let's do this one. And by the way, anybody on Twitter, anybody out there, if you all have any questions, just, just, just tweet them our way. Uh, anybody that has access to the chat, also do that. All right, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like to refer to this as the world's most inconvenient taser. Um, this is uh, plugged into the wall, but it is basically the same thing as a taser. If you touch this when it's on, it'll shock you. It is a Tesla coil. That's right. Um, I am not going to electrocute my mom. I have accidentally touched this. It does hurt, um, but it's like the worst like shock that you've gotten from touch touching the doorknob in the winter. That's like as bad as it gets. All right. So, uh, all right. I'm going to bring up the thing a little bit. All right, so this is a Tesla coil. It's high voltage, but low current. So safety first, it's the mills that kill, it's the volts that jolt. So it's high voltage and it'll give you a jolt, but it won't kill you. But mills, it's short for milliamps, that's the amount of current, the amount of electricity, that's what gets you. So this is not high current, so it's not gonna hurt my mom. Good. All right, so can you hear that? I don't know, sometimes uh, the sound noise cancellation. Okay, we can hear that. So that's the, uh, the sound of the machine itself, but there's also a crackly noise that is literally thunder. If you can see, let me see if I can kind of block it. I don't know if you can see the little tiny spark. A little bit, yes, yeah, you can see a little bit. That's the little baby lightning. We made little baby lightning. Let's make some bigger lightning. All right, this is basically the same thing as the plasma ball, but a different shape. So mom, I want you to know, maybe turn off the light. You want to turn off the light? Um, yeah, let's go ahead and turn off the lights. Uh, but I want to show you this before that. Yeah. So she's going to hold this and then we're going to make some lightning. Go ahead. You can turn off both of them. Thank you. Can you see, see you okay without tripping on? Sorry, all of my kids' toys are also in the basement. So it's a, uh, a bit of an obstacle course. So, so hold it like that. Uh -huh. like one hand. Hand. Two hands. All right. All right. Here we go. 
Let me see. Yeah, so there's a little spark in between uh, the Tesla coil and this uh, plasma toy thing, but there's also plasma inside. So there's actually two different densities of air. There's two amounts of air per volume. There's less air in this thing than there is all around us in the same amount of space. So high density air, like a lot of like high pressure, like normal air pressure is 16 pounds per square inch. That's actually really hard to turn into a plasma with high voltage. It's actually easier in there. So you need a high voltage for that short distance to make that arc. Has anybody heard, you know, if anybody's heard of the arc, uh, an arc flash? This is arcing across the space at 30,000 volts per uh, half an inch. It doesn't so, hurt. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. All right. Thank you, Mom. You can turn on the light. All right. Give, everybody, uh, give my mom a virtual round of applause. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you want to do actually one more time? Do you want to do the? Do you want to do that with the bridge using the bridge? Uh, using the the half coated as a bridge to the to the blue one. Sure. Okay. So we got this. Oh, but no, yeah. Can we do my video? Yeah. Go back to yeah. All right. So this is the same thing as this, but smaller. All right. So mom, come back up. And uh, I guess we can. Why don't you turn off just the light closest to me so we have a little bit of light to navigate? All right. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay. So hold it again like a steering wheel. Vroom, vroom. <clears throat> okay, uh, and back up a little bit, and then I'm going to hold this one in between, and we're going to see if we can get the electricity to go all the way across. All right, does everybody see that? And can I do it, or do I have to? Touch. I think you're going to have to touch it. Uh, okay. There we go. <laughs> all right, but what you can tell though is that they. Like, look, it'll even light up when I'm not even close to it. Um, but it only goes up to where my hand is. Oh. Because now my hand is the, what connects, what completes the circuit. Uh, so if I hold it down lower, it's going to light up less of it. All right. Thank you, Mom. Awesome. So since we're on the theme of atmospheric plasmas, what about electrostatic and maybe some lightning caused by the Van der Graaff? Oh, let's do that. Okay, let's see. All right. So remember in Arturo's video, or the, the video that we showed at the beginning, and uh, Arturo was talking about why fusion is hard, uh, that those, you know, those two little uh, hydrogen atoms that uh, eventually they came together and kissed and then stuck together and they fused? That's what we want to happen, but they don't want to do that, right? They're, uh, they've are they got the same charges, uh, or sorry, yeah, light charges repel and opposites attract, right? So uh, the particles, when they get those electrons ripped off, now they're charged particles. You've got negative electrons and positive ions, atoms with less electrons than they have protons. And so now you've got positive ions that don't want to hang out. But if you get them going fast enough, you're going to smash them together and they're going to stick. Like if you're going 125 miles down, uh, mile, 20, 125 miles an hour down the turnpike, you're more likely to crash. Please don't do that. Um, than you are to you know drive five miles an hour down a, a quiet residential street. You're not going to. You're not very likely to crash. So, mom, would you like to get shot? <laughs> I keep threatening to shock my mother. Um, all right. And I still <laughs> you're still willing to. All right, so before you stand on the stool, I'm going to have you just stand to the side. Um, and let's see. Okay. So maybe people have seen uh, this before. This is a Van de Graaff generator. Um, and what's going to happen is when I turn this on, it's going to be a little loud and maybe it'll be hard to hear me. Uh, the, there's like a rubber uh, fan belt in here. And it's going to be scooping up electrons and building them up in here. And it's just like when you shuffle your feet on the carpet in the wintertime, and then you touch a doorknob or your friend, and you get shocked. Let's do that. All right. All right. I can see it here. But it might be too hard to see. 
see. Yeah, you can you can see it. Yeah, you can see that that little spark jumping from the wand from the wand to the to the big sphere. All right. Yeah. And by the way, just as a rule of thumb, for every for every centimeter of atmospheric plasma, you have to build up a voltage of ten thousand volts, right? So so that's the amount of voltage that's going. And remember from the, the, the light socket is 120, right? So it's it's much higher voltage. But as Shannon said, it's the voltage jolt, it's the milk that kills very little current. All right, so mom, I'm gonna have you go ahead and stand on that stool. So we're elevating her off the ground. We're getting some space between her and the floor. All right, and what I want, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to put your hands flat on the ball. It's not gonna shock you, I promise and keep it there until I tell you to take it off, okay? I'm gonna take this off and you're gonna keep your hand right there and we're gonna see what happens. And then when we're all done, I'm gonna have you put your hands by your side and jump very carefully onto the floor with both feet at the same time and not stand. Okay, I'll tell you when that happens. I know I might do that. Okay, well, you'll get a tiny shock at the end. It's a super tiny shock for that, okay? All right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Can you feel anything? What does it feel like? A little tingling on the side of my face. Uh huh. Can you take your free hand, not the hand touching the ball, and kind of oh, lift your hair a little bit? It's already kind of going on. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, you can get it. Nice so we can see it. <laughs> Best mama word. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, she totally wins. <laughs> <laughs> you win for best mom. Here, uh, look ahead at that door because your hair in the front is really going up. Look at that! Okay. Yeah, you get tingly, you feel tingles through your hair. Yeah. All right. So what I want you to do now is uh, when I tell you, not yet, put your hands by your side and do your best to get off that stool carefully and then just step away from the chair. All right. Get down. There we go. There you go. Right. So the way she did it, the way she jumped off, um, it's it's an easy way to, to get rid of the charges without getting shocked because you're quickly um, putting your feet on the on the ground and you have a bigger surface. So a lot the current spend like has a very has a large amount of surface to get rid of. So it doesn't it doesn't really hurt. Awesome. And that's it's hard. Yeah. So the reason the reason fusion art is you, you saw what was happening to her hair, right? It was going everywhere. That's because there was this uh, life charges filling up not just that ball. When well, now we've got my mom added to the equation, it's filling up the ball and my mom. So she's filled with all these same charges, uh, and it and her hair is too. And so her every charge is trying to get away from life charges. So it's just spreading out as far as it can. Her hair is trying to get away from her. Yes. So uh, there's a question in the chat. It sounded like she got shocked. Uh, did, did, did she get shocked? No. So the shock that you probably heard at the very oh, end, uh, the, yeah, because it does make a loud popping sound, lightning, I mean thunder, yeah. So when she, uh, when she got off, there might have been a slight crackle when she touched the ground, but probably what you heard was when I immediately touched that wand to the big ball, that discharges and, and, and it now get that that wand is a path to the ground and so it sparks and puts all the electricity back in the ground where it's a huge source of neutral charge is like everything can balance out right. so i think so we're we're um we're running a little bit uh short on time and i really want to get to the the, spe the, the spectroscopic tubes oh, right sure. so one of the this this is really great because one of the big uses of plasma in history <laughs> has been astronomy. So when you look, when, 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 thanks. So, so when you look at, um, um, at the stars and when, and when scientists across the, 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 the centuries have said, the stars are made out of this, of this material, um, they're this far away, all of that has come from plasmas, from the light being emitted from the stars and uh, scientists taking a look at, what um at what light is is coming into the instrument um so I, I think most of you know that when you have light coming through a prism it separates the prism separates the lights into the different wavelengths right because of the speed of the different wavelengths within the glass um 
every, uh, as, as Shannon's going to show, every element, because of the way the electrons are in the orbitals, um, are emitting light at a different wavelength. So why don't you, yeah, Shannon, so I'll, I'll let you take it away. All right. So one of my favorite, and yeah, we'll spotlight my video again. Yeah, I think we can spotlight Shannon. Yeah. So uh, what I've got here is a tiny vial of a particular gas. And, we're, and we don't know what that gas is just by looking at it because it's invisible. What we can find out when we turn into a plasma, though, is what gas it is. We can, fit, we can determine what gas it is by this signature rainbow. Let's make some rainbows. All right. Ooh, I guess that's already on. Okay, uh, so that's what it looks like to the naked eye. I might dim it to, with the sunglasses so you can see it a little better. Um, and now we're gonna uh, we're gonna break up that light and see what colors make that particular composite color. So go ahead and turn off the light. I tried one first, and we'll see. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so this is a flat uh, diffraction grating. It's like a flat prism. So this is gonna break up the light into all these different colors. So what, uh, if we have uh, the ability to do it quickly, can everybody put uh, in the chat what colors they see? Yeah. What color are people seeing? Red. There's blues, there's reds. Yeah, mm -hmm. red, yellow, blue, purple. Yeah. Yeah. Not the whole rainbow. Pink, something. Most yeah. colors, right? Um, but it's got these big, uh, these definite, like, discrete, distinct lines. These lines are super important, especially these lines. So this gas is helium. It will always have those particular lines. I'm going to do a different one real quick. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, so I'm going to turn the fluorescent light bulb. Um, you can do it oh. to show the full spectrum, yeah. Yes. Um, all right. So I'm going to show you. Um, oh, I already unplugged it, though. I'm going to show you the, the, same, uh, the same fluorescent light bulb that I showed you before with the magnets. We're going to turn that one on again, and I'll show you um, that gas's particular lines. And actually, I'll show you. Uh, uh, all right. Okay. okay, so here's that same fluorescent light bulb. So on the bottom, I mean, it's, a, it's not a perfect uh, rainbow like you'd see from completely natural light. Uh, but uh, on the, the on the bottom half, it's giving a pretty full spectrum, close to natural white light. Uh, on the top, though, what colors do you see? We see again the greens, the blues, yeah. less of the red and the and the yellows. Yeah. Yeah. So on the top half, you don't really have uh, all the colors. You really have a blue stripe and a green stripe. Those are the clear ones. So that. Uh, let's see if we can. Oh, what gas this one is. Do those look like the same colors to you? Very similar, yeah. Right? So those are the pretty much the same colors. So those are the same gas. They're both mercury. I'll put them side by side. That might interfere with each other, but you can see the little tiny skinny one of the, but it's kind of getting obliterated by the bright one. So that gas is mercury. So if you ever see that blue and green line coming off the plasma, you know that plasma is mercury. All right, so now we're going to show you a different one. Every gas has its own special signature. And this is really important because you can use it to determine the composition of uh, the stars, uh, nebula, plasmas in the lab, uh, different neon lights. If you ever see neon lights that are not this color, it's not neon. So this particular vial is filled with neon. So let's see. Oh. No, no, just uh, just in a second, Faith. Um, let's finish the spectroscopy. Thank All you. Right. So, so this, uh, these lines, you mostly see a red, an orange, and a yellow. Uh, so those spectral lines are unique to neon. Now, why I think helium is especially cool is because 
of a story about an astronomer at the turn of the century, uh, Cecilia Payne. Cecilia Payne uh, was a British astronomer. Uh, she got her start in Cambridge, and then she uh, found that there were more opportunities for women scientists in the US at the time. And so she joined the Harvard Observatory, and she worked with photographic plates, images that came from uh, the uh, from the telescope at Harvard, and she wrote her PhD thesis on what she found. She studied these lines coming off of all the stars, and at the time, most people thought that the stars and the sun were made up of basically the same stuff that the Earth was, mostly iron and like rock stuff. Uh, but she knows these spectral lines really well, so she saw these lines, and she saw also the lines for hydrogen. So this is helium and she saw hydrogen and her data confirmed that the sun and the stars were mostly hydrogen and helium. And that was really completely different from what most people thought. So she sent her uh, thesis for review to uh, Professor Russell at Princeton. She was at Harvard and she sent it to Princeton and he was the authority at the time and he was like, no, that's not right. That can't be right. So she actually added a line in her thesis saying, this is what my data shows, but it's probably wrong. Five years later, he did his own experiments, saw the same spectral lines, and went, you know what? It is actually hydrogen and helium, and he got a lot of the credit. He did acknowledge that she had contributed to this, and he did say that she had told him this already, but then he got most of the credit throughout history that he uh, that the sun and the stars were mostly hydrogen and helium, but she was the one that told us all what stars are made out of. Fantastic. Actually, Joanna say, is asking, so she didn't publish first? She did publish first. She published, but it was her PhD thesis. It wasn't like a peer-reviewed journal article. It was a thesis. Right. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Shannon, so much for all the demos. Um, let me finish up. We're 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 finishing up now. Um, Faith, can you can you put up the the slide? Thanks. The slide thirteen. Let's go. Let's go forward a little bit, and let's just finish. Yeah. So go, keep on going. One more. Uh, more. One more. So uh, just to just to uh, you know to, to um, emphasize the point, um, we need to get for fusion plasma. We need to get it really hot. How hot? Ten times hotter than the center of the sun. So as you saw, and we do this, we actually do this on a regular basis in magnetic fusion devices in our lab and all around the world. And the way we do it is with magnets. And uh, we didn't really talk about this, but the the northern lights and southern lights are the reason we see them only at the north and the south is because the earth is like a big magnet and the, the plasma coming from the sun gets trapped on it and goes to the north and the south so as you saw in the video we use donut shaped devices with magnetic fields in the middle to get to confine the plasma we heat it up a lot and then we we get fusion inside so next next slide so uh faith the, the next slide please one more slide <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So um, the, I really want to leave you with this message. Uh, we are uh, scientists, public engagers here um, in, in the Zoom, but the, we have more than 500 people in our lab, um, and there are much more in all the other labs, and we're much more than scientists. We need, for, to get this mission going, to get fusion energy in the grid, we need technicians, we need chemists, human resources, accountants, we need engineers, we, we need a vast array of, of workers and of skill sets in order to get the mission uh, in, in our lab and all the national labs forward. So I really wanna acknowledge the hard work that goes on all throughout the complex uh, from all the different sectors. And come, um, come, and help save the come again? Come help, come help us and save the world. <laughs> yes, please help us save the world. <laughs> And with that, thank you very much for having us. And if you have any questions, I don't know if we have any time. Right. Like one minute. Okay. Thank you so much for that engaging demo and presentation. It, that was fabulous. It was so much fun and a special shout out to mom for her assistance. We were forever indebted to your joining the team. So I don't Thank think there's you. any 
any questions, but we really enjoyed having you.